but that willingness to be uncomfortable and to be super honest and to push yourself to levels that you didn't know of or to see your teammates or your players do things that you didn't think were capable. I think a lot of it has to do with the culture. That was UMass Amherst associate head coach Jared DeMichael, and this is the Next Shift Podcast. All right, welcome to episode 58 of the Next Shift Hockey Podcast. Uh, it's just George and myself, Ryan Coffey, today. My brother is in the midst of the USHL draft today. So there's a, a lot of work to be done with a lot of the players that uh, he's assisting um, with their hockey careers. But um, we're excited for our interview today. It's with Jared DeMichael, the associate head coach of the UMass Minutemen, the reigning national champions. Um, we're excited to talk with him. I know G uh, D Mike, as he's referred to, I know D Mike fairly well. I was at St. Lawrence while he was there um, for a couple of years. So I'm excited to chat with him, get to know him uh, on a, on a more personal level and hear more about his, his path to where he is today. But George, what's going on? What do you got for us? Uh, not much. Yeah, I'm excited for the interview with D. Mike. Um, it's tough, you know, have, not having Sean here, uh, losing him to an upper body injury today as, as a scratch because he's. <laughs> I just had to do a couple takes myself trying to do the uh, walking episode 58. I struggled a bit. I was fighting it. So good job by you. But yeah, pumped to have D. Mike on. Um, for everyone that doesn't know, like we had Greg Carvel on too, and um, that was before they won the national championship. So. Um, I think it's going to be great to talk about that, like what his team went through to to win it. And I think D Mike just has a great story to what we're trying to stick to, right? Like um, pretty great, great career. And he's just popped up in our feed right now. Great career, uh, great story. And um, we're just, we're happy to have him on. So should we yeah, kick like, it over, kick yeah, it over the interview? It over. Let's do it. This episode is brought to you by Sandland Logistics. Sandland Logistics is a family-owned, nationwide, truckload brokerage team in business for over 30 years. Contact Sandland Logistics to manage your dedicated, expedited, and specialized trucking needs. From point A to point B, providing excellent customer service, 24-7 availability, capacity, and reliability. Let them overperform for you. Reach out to them at info at sandlandlogistics.com or by phone at 860-687-6940. And be sure to check out their brand new website, sandlandlogistics.com. Eight seconds to go. Cranelock, redirection. Bouncing behind the net. Save. Watch out! Watch out! UMass are national There he is. Can you, can you hear me? Did I do this right? Yeah, oh, yeah. you're good. Let let's me. Go. Um, let's go. Let me get this set up. You, do you want me to get my barrel in the shot here? <laughs> <laughs> well, Ryan, did you oh, want to did you want to tell the story of uh, Sean, or should we do that later? Yeah, we can do that later. We uh, just so you know, D Mike, me and my brother <laughs> playing a men's league together on Tuesday nights, typically on the same team. And uh, last night he got he got moved over to the other team, and there was one play we have live barn footage of it too and uh i i i, <laughs> I took exception to it i didn't i didn't like the uh the play he made so we were barking at each other i went after him a few times but Wait, solved it last he slash you or turn over the puck or what he do so like he kind of like ran a high, like I, like on a high roll he like picked me almost Ooh, okay okay and, uh, i didn't see him so <laughs> the uh it was kind of like a blindside. My stick went flying. He didn't hit my head, but I mean, we were also 3D. The oxygen wasn't getting to the head. I was a little cranky. It was. Uh... He, he's the older brother, isn't he? Oh yeah, he's the so older he's brother. Still, he's still big league, and yeah, even whatever years down the road. You know yeah, what's you know bit. what's funny about that, Ryan, is when uh, one of Gunner's like first. I think it was just captain's practice at St. Lawrence. Like um, we were just having a scrimmage, and it was Gunner's like first time on the ice, and he stole the puck from me on the blue line and I was so pissed and he went on a breakaway and I just, I kind of gave him a tomahawk 
And then he just came right after me and just like kind of took me down and we were just like grappling on the ice. So that was my only uh, fight experience, <laughs> <laughs> but I'll never forget that. Oh man, we might have to keep that part actually. We might have to put that. Yeah, in. We'll, we'll see how it goes. But yeah, um, D Mike, we... thanks for coming on. We uh, we're excited to talk with you. First and foremost, congrats on the on the on the the natty. Must be uh, yeah. Hopefully, you're still basking in the glory a little bit. Yeah, no, it's. I've told a few people this. It's been uh, different than what you'd expect. I think our players are kind of basking in it. They're like they're having a grand old time. I know they were on campus and stuff like that, as they should. Um, but for us coaches, um, there's a lot of unforeseen work just with uh, with some guys signing that we weren't totally expecting, but we're super happy for them for their opportunity. Um, Zach Jones, Mark Delgazo, awesome for those guys. Um, but even like Oliver Chow, we had planned on – we thought he was coming back to take advantage of his fifth year, and he decided to go on the transfer portal. So we kind of had to uh, whatever piece together, find some players. But we're excited about the roster for next year, but then also too – when teams have success, my my old co-worker that shares the office here, Ben Barr, he got a job at Maine. That's right. Um, and he's obviously more than deserving, and he's been kind of waiting patiently to be a head coach. So he's gone, and then our hockey ops director got a really good job outside of the hockey world. Um, but this week, it's actually been really good timing for, for you guys, at least, and for me, where this has kind of been the first week when I've actually been able to chill. Um, I know whatever probably most people on the outside think college coaches just – kind of twiddle their thumbs and golf every single day. But my wife will tell you, I've been on my phone a crazy amount um, the whole month of May and the second half of April, just trying to figure out our roster for next year and then figuring out our staff. Obviously, th that, those are all carved decisions. And I just try to support him and, and give him um, my two cents when he wants it. So, um, but it's just whatever. It's different. Like I said, our players, they were like rock stars. We got off the bus and they're freaking crowd surfing and people are freaking chucking them things to drink and they're running around with the trophy. And I think they're having uh, some fun with some things off campus and stuff like that. Um, but for us coaches, like it was a lot more work related and Carver and I were even talking about that. Like we were just kind of blindsided. It wasn't the the work that you were expecting, but again, um, I would take that work after the national championship. If that means winning another natty, um, but obviously super, super proud of our group and what they accomplished and the seniors that took a leap of faith on us after winning only five games to come here and change the culture and elevate things. And um, it's whatever, it's, it's very um, special to be a part of and puts a lot of pride. And we're, we're really optimistic about next year's team too. No, I love that. We're super happy for you guys. And um Absolutely. I know I was I read a I read a quote from uh, Carvey just, you know, talking about the experience of winning the national championship and just having everyone on the bench kind of as the final seconds tick down, look like everyone was looking each other in the eyes, just taking it in. And he said it would just be like the best, you know, moment of, of their lives almost. So if you just talk about what that feeling was like. Yeah, no, I want to talk about that in another instance. Um, and obviously, I know I know George. I know you're a little bit of a Carvey super fan. You got some Carvey PJs that you wear late at night when you get <laughs> sleep, which is totally rightfully so. Carves the man. Um, but the, but the, the game before against Duluth, Duluth was playing really well. I thought for the first two periods they outplayed us. Better puck possession, got their four check going. They were on top of us. We didn't create anything. And the second half of the second period, both Coach Barr and I started to get a little fired up. Like we were kind of giving it to, to the guys. We were kind of chirping them, trying to bring some energy, some passion. And then after that second period, like we got into our coach's room and Carves like, hey, like everybody just take a breath. I got this. Very calm, like nonchalant. Comes his time to talk in between the second and the third. And he just like blisters the boys, like just gets into them. Like we came all the way here, dealt with COVID, all the testing. We got guys back on campus and that's the effort that we're going to bring for 40 minutes. Like you got to be kidding me. Like we got 20 minutes to muster it up. And uh, it was an epic, an epic in between periods talk. Um, we got a little bit better in the third. And I think that kind of snowballed into overtime that we played really well. Um, and then obviously the national championship, it was great to get back those, those three guys that were, were quarantining and whatnot. Um, but it, it was, yeah, true story there. Third, third period, our last time out. Um, and I, again, you'd have to ask Carve this, but like he brought us all in. And I don't, I figured he'd just be like, hey, like smart puck decisions, 
good defensive position, get above your guy, get into your guy. And he was like, Hey, um, soak this in. Um, we got three minutes. We need to finish the game the right way, but you guys are national champions. Look around, look at each other. We're going to remember this moment for the rest of our lives. And I know you don't believe me right now, but we're never going to be together in the same room together ever again. And I know that's hard to comprehend right now. And even for me, I remember when he said that, I'm like, no, like we're all going to go back to the hotel and then we're going to be on campus. Like, no, we're going to be together. And then like we win, we're all on the ice together. And then we take the bus back where we're like, we're on separate bus because of COVID. Some guys go back to the hotel. Some go to different places with their family, whoever. And like we, whatever, we haven't been in the same spot or end of the year banquet that we had. We were missing guys, obviously, because Jones had signed. Gaudet and Gashevis were both playing in the American League. Dalgaizo had signed. Um, so it, it was a special moment. And even after the game, too, um, I mean, again, there's not many too, too many times in a championship game that you're going to have a good enough lead. But Carr, Coach Barr, and I, all of us to kind of embrace. Like, we've, we've been through a lot. And uh, we're whatever. Coach – Coach Barr's obviously moved on, but Coach Carvel and I, like, we're going to continue to have to kind of battle and, and stuff like that. But um, it's 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 awesome to be a part of, and that that was a super super special moment. Yeah, that's incredible, and I think this is all stuff we're going to want to circle back on. But before we do that, let's let's take it to your own personal story, your own personal playing career. Um, and I just, you know, I'm just going to be straight up. Like, what were you thinking becoming becoming a goalie? Like, what what happened? <laughs> what happened? That, that, so that that's a good story. Um, so I, I grew up um, hockey. I got into hockey because of the Hartford Whalers. Um, my, my dad, he, he doesn't know anything about hockey. He loves the game. Um, my dad is a, a baseball, basketball guy. Those were his sports. But growing up in Connecticut, the Whalers were the only professional team. So we used to go to games. We only had two tickets. Um, I would sit on my mom or dad's lap, and my sister would sit on the other mom or dad's lap. That's how we got in. There was four of us, but we only had two seats. Um, And then when I used to skate on ponds, um, growing up in Connecticut, uh, Torrington, Connecticut, Bessie Pond used to skate out there and kind of whatever, George, you would appreciate this. I grew up uh, playing for Watertown Youth Hockey, the Watertown Red Wings. That's where I started. I played in-house and then I played squirts, um, travel. And then when it came time for Pee Wees, I got cut from Watertown. I knew I wasn't an 18, 18 player. I was, um, my skating was average, but I worked hard. I could score. But when it came time to check, my head was buried a little bit too much. Um, so when I got cut from Watertown, it was kind of like a crossroads. Like, do we go somewhere new? Cause I can't play here anymore. Or do I change positions? And I think whatever, I don't think it was my parents. I was just like, Hey, like I always play goalie and roller hockey and I have fun and I'm pretty good. And my parents not being hockey people are knowing any better and knowing what it's like to be a goalie parent or how expensive the position is. They were like, yeah, go try out the goalie thing. So um, I tried it out that summer, went to a few goalie schools. And um, my first year, I ended up whatever playing for Avon Youth Hockey. I made the Pee Wee B team. But my first year, I'm not going to lie, like I, I was brutal. I was a duster, like shots from the, the far blue line, far end. Like they were going through me, around me, any which way, like whatever. Um but I think I was lucky from the goalie standpoint that my my dad and my mom, they were really supportive. I played a ton of different sports, like not trying to pump my tire, but I was a pretty good athlete. And I think because I was a good athlete, like that helped me understand the position physically. Mentally, obviously, that's where the game can really grow the most for a goalie. Um, but I, I was a forward up until Pee Wee's. And when I got cut from Watertown and had nowhere else to play, that's how I got into the position. Um, you can look at pictures of me my first year. I had like Bruins colored pads. I had black and white gloves, like none of the stuff matched. Like it was a debacle. My helmet, um, my dad knew a guy in town in Torrington, Connecticut, and he used like markers to paint on my helmet. Cause we thought that like, that's how you do a paint job. Like we didn't know about airbrushing and that stuff. Um, I mean, I got hilarious stories too. Even when I was a Ford, the first camp that I went to was like the Hartford Whalers, um, like junior program camp, I went on the ice. I had a, a street hockey stick, so it was wood, and the blade was plastic, and the, the, it was curved the wrong way. It was a purple blade, but like we thought, like hell yeah, that's what you use on the street. Like that's what you can use on the ice. I hop on the ice. Guy comes over to me and he's talking to me. My mom's like, 
cheeks or to her ears. She's so excited. Like my kid's going to be a stud. I get off the ice an hour later. She's like, Hey, what did you say to you? I'm like, mommy told me it's a street hockey stick and it's curved the wrong way. Um, I give my parents a ton of credit. Like we had no idea what we were doing. There was no internet. Um, so we didn't know where to got buy gear. Like we would get it at freaking like Kmart and Walmart. Um, same thing with my skates. We'd use masking tape on my shin guards. We'd use electrical tape on my stick blade. Like we didn't know that there was like actual hockey tape until years later. So, uh, but or whatever, I, I think those kind of stories are what's kind of funny and, and makes it worthwhile. And eventually from the goalie aspect, um, I, I gradually got better and started to work my way up and stuff like that. D Mike, I have a question just playing off that, that kind of popped into my head. Do you, you know, there's, you know, you have people like George and myself, who's, whose dad, you know, both our dads were big hockey people, you know, like, so we were, we were probably on skates, you know, George, I don't know what you were, I think I was skating at three. And, you know, when I look back on it, I, I sometimes think, oh, like, you know, I kind of, I kind of wish maybe he didn't know as much about the game and I could kind of figure it out on my own. Not, not that I'm very thankful for what he had, but is there, given you're kind of seeing different players now and you're seeing different upbringings, is there advantages to having those parents who kind of just let you go and they, there's no real expectation, right? Like, whereas, you know, sometimes if your dad played the game or your dad had success in the game, or even if your mom had success in the game, it just kind of like, Maybe there are some pressures there. Maybe there are, um, you know, expectations that are put on you from the jump, you know? Yeah. No, I, I think obviously there's, there's pluses and minuses to both. I mean, obviously, and, and you guys have been around the game long enough, but I learned it really fast back in like mites and squirts. Like sometimes you, your dad or your mom's name can get your foot in the door, can help you make a team. And I didn't have that. Um, but I, I do think it helped me to like kind of carve my own path and learn from my mistakes. And I think all the time, and we do this here at UMass, like you learn a lot more from losing than you do from winning. And you lose a lot more from your failures than you do from your successes. Um, so I, as, as a, as a player, I think it helped like whatever my mom and my dad, I can remember like I gave up a five hole goal and my mom's like, what's the big deal? You like, you just put your pads together and you fall down. Like, what's the big deal? Like that's such an easy save. I'm like, well, there's a lot of things that go into it, a lot of different situations. Um, but I think as a, as a goalie, I think it helped me be creative where I didn't have someone kind of pounding me in my ear, like go out there and make a save. And I would watch different players. And um, my dad, my dad's very street smart with hockey. Like he got me around good people um, people that he think that he thought were going to have high integrity that were going to push me to be coached. Um, and then he, he got out of the way, which was awesome. Obviously you guys see it at some of the rinks now, like crazy hockey parents and knock on wood. I hope if, if my, my son or my daughter are to play, um, I hope that I can just sit back and relax and just let the coaches coach and things like that. Um, again, there's, there, there's, there's advantages and disadvantages to both, but I think for me, um, I think it's helped shape me as a person. It shaped me as a hockey player. Um, I got cut from so many different teams, um, from mites all the way to pro hockey. Um, but I think again, it's, it's those hard chips have grown my passion for the game. And that's why I love it so much. And that's why I think it's the, the greatest sport on earth. Yeah. I, I definitely agree with the getting cut part that I think that that was a huge, um, experience for me in terms of, my my success, I guess you could say, but I wanted to jump ahead to Avon Old Farms, and I guess you could maybe look at this as another uh, part of adversity. W what was your relationship like with Jonathan Quick? Were you playing behind him? Were you his backup? And what was that experience like at Avon? Yeah, so we we grew up in whatever, both in the state of Connecticut. Um, again, not trying to go too much down the youth hockey vortex, but like basically, Quick was the best eighty six goalie in the state arguably um i was the best 85 goalie arguably and that's going to date me whatever with those birth dates and whatnot um and i was already at avon for two years and uh so my junior year was my first chance at varsity they, they cut me my freshman and sophomore year put me on the jv team so when i finally made the team my junior year quick was coming in as a sophomore um and basically that year we split um None of us would ever really could take the reins. I want to say maybe like early on, 
I had a little bit better of a start and then I kind of dropped and then he had a little bit better of an ending. Um, and then the start of the, my senior year, his junior year, he, he had the net and never really relinquished it. I really didn't get to see the light of day. Um, we, we had a good relationship, uh, positive. We were, we were good friends and stuff like that. Um, I, obviously there's that competitiveness when only one goalie can play, um, and can't argue, obviously, with his level of success that what he had at Avon in college and in the NHL. Um, but it was a tough pill to swallow. Whereas like, I'm, I'm watching other goalies and I think I'm pretty, I was pretty realistic of my expectations, but I'm like, I think I could start for that team. I think I could start for that team. I think I could start for this team. Like, and I didn't really get much of an opportunity. And um, that's a big, again, obviously I had to go play junior hockey because of that. But being from New England and you guys know this, like I just, everyone looked at me as a backup goalie and I had to go again, go out to the Midwest and carve a different path. Um, but I mean, I, I think it helped me. Um, we actually had three really, really good goalies at Avon, like the third string goalie, not a lot of people talk about too, but Ryan Donovan, he was a division three all American at UMass Boston. Like he really helped propel UMass Boston to the level that they're at now. But we had Jonathan Quick, a Con Smythe winner, Jared DeMichael, not a total schlub, and Ryan Donovan, a division three all American. Like I don't know how many prep schools had that depth in goaltending. Um, so but again, practicing was quick, was great. You got to see his athleticism and stuff like that. But again, it's not a perfect world, but in a perfect world, maybe would have gotten more of an opportunity or thrown more of a bone. But when Quick was playing so well, you can't argue with them kind of riding him. Yeah, and you mentioned uh, your junior career a little bit. It seems like uh, what is it? Four different leagues, five different <laughs> five, five different cities. You were you were a suitcase. So what happened? Yeah. No, big time. So um, my senior year with Avon at this after the season ended. This will date me too, George, you being a Chicago guy, but I went out to the Chicago showcase with Team Connecticut, and that's where Springfield and the NA saw me. They liked me, but they still didn't even draft me. They were just like, oh, we got other people that we're going to draft. So um, I went out to their training. I went out to their open camp in Chicago, moved on from the open camp to the main camp, went to main camp, had to beat out two goalies that they drafted, um, had a really good camp, made the team was there the whole year. And then at the end of the season, um, kind of a crazy story, Pat Maroon, he was playing for the St. Louis uh, midget team, came up to practice with us. He was a draft pick. He smoked me, blew out my shoulder. So I was basically out for the last two or three weeks. Um, and we ended up just missing playoffs. And at the end of that season, the coach there, um, I thought I had a pretty good year. And he was just like, hey, you're going to have to come back and totally earn your spot on this team. And um well, we'll, we can't make you any guarantees. So when I heard that, I was like, crap, like I better go somewhere else. And, um, tried to make the USHL. I actually was, oh, I thought I was going to make the Chicago Steel. And I'm, I'm at the Chicago Steel main camp and right in the middle of main camp, they trade for a veteran goalie and I was an age out. And they're like, Hey, we, we thought you were going to be our age out goalie, but we just traded for this kid from Sioux Falls that's already played two years in the league. He's got more experience than you. That's where we're going to go with. So. You can't really blame their coaching staff for that decision. So then I'm at a crossroads. Like, where do I go? Like Springfield says, like, I'm basically not on the team. I need to go somewhere else. And being an Eastern guy, I was like, oh, I'll go back to the EJ. Good league. A lot of schools in the backyard. Easy to be seen. But by that time, it was like August. And the only team that had a place for me to play was the Boston Junior Harbor Bulls, which was one of the weaker teams in the league. But again, my, my dad may be looking – outside of the box a little bit. He's like, Hey, like you're not going to get a lot of run support, but you're going to stop a lot of pucks and teams are going to see you. So I went to the Harbor Wolves and our team wasn't great, but I saw a ton of shots, which I think actually that's where RIT first saw me. And then right before Thanksgiving, um, uh, someone out East that scouted for the Indiana ice was like, Hey, we need a veteran goalie really bad for Indiana. Would you come out there? And I was like, at the time I was only really talking to D three schools. So I was like, yeah, like, I'd love to go out to Indiana. So I went out to Indiana. Um, it was awesome there. I lived with the owner of the Scott family. They were awesome. It was, uh, I think it was the ice is only their second year in the USHL, like really, really enjoyed it. And then um, went home for Christmas time. And on Christmas Eve, um, I got a call from the assistant coach being like, Hey, um, 
we're going to release you or we're going to trade you. We're bringing in a, a, an overage Ford. So we wish you all the best. Merry Christmas. I'm like, are you kidding me? Like I just got dropped or traded on Christmas Eve. This is great. And just funny how the hockey world works out. The, um, the next day, I got a call from the Chicago Steel being like, hey, our overage goalie just blew out his knee. He's done for the year. We're going to make a trade for you. I'm like, holy crap. Like, thank you, hockey gods. Um, but kind of funny that morning, whatever, typical junior hockey, like whatever, I brought back my parents some presents. So I've got like Indiana ice swag coming out of the wazoo that I already wrapped up and giving it to my mom. And she's like holding up stuff in front of her eyes. And then she's like, bring it on the present. She's just got tears running down her face. And I'm like, mom, like, it's going to be fine. She's like, you're, you're like, I don't know where you're going to play, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, mom, like, you just got to relax. Like, I got to stop the puck and do a good job. And, and somebody's going to see me. And um, my parents were, were super, super supportive. I ended up going out to Chicago and um, had a great experience there. Our team didn't win a lot of games, but I got more of an opportunity to play. That that kind of picked things up with RIT. Um and I, whatever, made lifelong friends. My, my roommate, who I uh, lived with his family, Mike Janda, billeted with him. He ended up coming to RIT. We were both in each other's weddings. Um, so, again, it's crazy how the hockey world works out. But the suitcase stuff, usually when you see that, you're like, hey, like, like what the heck is this kid doing? Like, is he, like, uh, is he selling drugs or something? And I, that was not me. I just um, – I think I maybe needed to be a little bit better. And just the way that hockey works sometimes, um, it's a numbers game and you need to do a really good job. And I was just doing an okay job and need to be better. And finally found a spot there with Chicago where I could kind of have my roots and it kind of worked out. Yeah. So let's dive right into the RIT stuff. You have an outstanding career at RIT. I think your senior year, you led the nation in wins. You go to the Frozen Four. And from my, from what I, obviously a huge college hockey fan back then, I was probably in high school. Um, and I, I feel like that kind of put RIT on the map. You know, I, they probably always had a strong team. I know, um, they've had a, a coach there. Is it Wilson? Who's, who's always been there for a long time. Um, so, you know, what was that experience? Like kind of like coming, coming to this school RIT, that's not necessarily a powerhouse every year, but, you know, truly succeeding and, and getting them to that, you know, the top of the, of the mountain there at the frozen four, just, just take us through that. Yeah. No, the, the experience I had at RIT, like when it traded for the world, um, when I visited there, my parents were really excited because it's a strong academic school. Um, that was something really important. Obviously you, you go to a place like Avon old farms, you want to find a strong academic college. So when they first reached out, my dad's like, you should just go there. And I'm like, no, oh, like whatever, uh, hockey East, DCAC, like I kind of want to see with blah, 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 and situations, yeah. stuff like that. And he's like, no, like RIT. And I mean, at the time, and they still are, RIT is a financial aid school. Um, so I knew I wasn't going to get a scholarship. But uh, in the recruiting process, Scott McDonald, who was the assistant that did a lot of the work with me and, and Coach Wilson, they did a good job just building a relationship with me. Um, sending information about the school. And when I would, again, this was just kind of when YouTube was getting big, but like I would see their rank in the crowd. And it was um, when they were recruiting me that year, that was their first year of division one. But like, I saw the rank and I'm like, wow, like they pack that place and it's brand new to, new to D1. And then you visit campus, you learn more about the tradition of hockey. There is basically a division three powerhouse. Um, and they wanted to kind of grow and be a very strong division one program. Um, I, I really enjoyed my visit committed on the spot. Um, and then obviously whatever you guys can look up on hockey DB and elite prospects. I didn't play a ton my first two years. Um, but coach Wilson was very honest. And that's another reason too, that I loved RIT. When I visited coach Wilson was like, Hey, we've got two upperclassmen coming back. We're going to have them ahead of you as a freshman. You're going to have to watch for them and learn from them. Your, your games are going to be practiced. I'm going to try to get you in a game if I can, but after your freshman year, if you do well and you do well in practice, you can earn an opportunity. And I think a lot of people would have been like, oh, like he's not promising me anything or guaranteeing his starting job. But it was it was really refreshing with how he was very honest. And I kind of knew what things were going to look like. And my parents were really supportive and they wanted me to go to a school like that. And I heard really good things about Rochester, New York. Um, so my freshman year, I kind of just learned from two upperclassmen. We had a really good team. We run the regular season championship where we actually weren't able to contend in playoffs because there's a two year period 
when you go to Division One. Um, but that actually was whatever, not the end of the world, because I got to go to Panama City Beach with 15 of my teammates, which normally you wouldn't be able to do. So that was pretty fun to do. Um, and then the next year, I uh, I had a slow start to the season. The other goalie played really well. He deserved to play. So I didn't really get too much of a sniff. Um, but the second half of my sophomore season, I got in against Niagara. And then another crazy story. The only reason I got in against Niagara, and you guys can look this up on YouTube, the other goalie, Louis Menard, got into a fight at center ice with the Canisius goalie. Like, and you don't see that in college hockey, but the two no. of them squared up, went at it. We had a full line brawl and he got suspended for two games because he fought. So because of that, I got back in and, and one of the games was against Niagara. They were a top 20 team in the nation. Um, I played pretty well, was one of the three stars in the game. So that gave me a lot of confidence. And then going into my junior year, um, I had a, the exit meeting at the end of my sophomore year with the coaching staff. And I was like, Hey, like I've been here two years. If I come back in really good shape and have a really good camp, can you just give me an early game? And I have to be in good shape and I have to have a good camp. And if I suck, don't give me anything. But if I earn it, can you give me one of the two games? And they're like, yeah, we'll wait and see. And I thought I came back in pretty good shape. I had a good camp. They, they gave me our second start against Western Michigan um, played pretty well, was the first star of the game. We beat Western Michigan at Western Michigan. Um, and then guy actually, I wasn't supposed to play the next week and I actually played against St. Lawrence in our blue cross game. We, we lost that game two to one, but I played pretty well. And that gave me a lot of confidence from there on. Um, and then my, my senior year was, it was awesome. We, we had a slow start. Um, but we had a good team. We went on two big winning streaks and we just had a ton of confidence going into playoffs. Um, we won the regular season by a landslide. And then when we got in the NCAA tournament, we had to face Denver and UNH. That were two obviously household names in college hockey. Um, but we had a very much a, an underdog mentality, but we were very confident. We were an older group. I, I was 24 turning 25. We had whatever, a lot of old balls on our team that had kind of been around the block. So we were playing these teams, maybe a little younger, maybe a little bit more so-called talented. Um, but we, we played to our identity. We played what we call Tiger hockey. And obviously having a defenseman on the team like Chris Tanev definitely helps. Um, but we, we had a good group. It was a special group. It was a fun group. We're still really, really tight. I, I, I'm in a WhatsApp group with the RIT teammates. There's like 60 of us in it. We still chirp each other to this day. Um, but they're also super support, uh, supportive when UMass, we go to the NCAA tournament. Frozen Four, that stuff. Like they're texting the group, they're sending pictures of me making funny, making fun about my nose, looking, making fun about how fat I am now. <laughs> um, but that, those are the things with college hockey that are really special. Like I have um, fifty basically best friends from the rest of my life from college, and um, we're obviously now we're getting older and grayer and fatter. But there's there's bachelor parties, there's weddings, there's kids being born, so we all stay in part on that end. But yeah, no, RIT was a great experience and really really good for me where I had to kind of earn everything that I got. Um, and I think it helped me become a man. And also my relationship with, with Coach Wilson, Coach Hills, Coach Insulaco, Coach Line, Coach McDonald, I think kind of helped shape me and um, kind of helped me get a little intrigued on the coaching side of things too. Yeah, there's a couple of things I want to follow up there. Um, you know, some people could say that you got lucky, or but I just think about how easy it could have been for you to quit in, in, at Avon or in junior, you know, or – early uh, at RIT and I know Sean li like likes to talk about this and I like when he does he talks about advocating for yourself like you did with your coach and just believing in your abilities so you just talk about that a little bit yeah no um I don't know I mean I'm, I'm, I still have this personality and uh, I think I get it from my parents where uh, my dad's a super hard worker my mom is very very passionate and they've just they instilled that in me growing up like don't take no for an answer. Don't let anyone tell you you can't do something. Um, prove them wrong. And I mean, at the time, like I would use that as motivation when I was working out, when I was skating, when I was training. Um, and I still I still do that every once in a while right now. I was actually <laughs> in Pittsburgh in the Frozen Four and I had gone for a long run in a while. I went for a five mile rip and I, I whatever got a little tired and I thought about some mf -er back in the day that told me I couldn't do something. And I'm like, no, I'm going to freaking make this run done. So, um, no, again, I just, I, I loved hockey. It was, it was a dream of mine. It was a goal of mine to play division one hockey. 
And I did everything that I could possibly do, whether it was my training on the ice, off the ice, my nutrition, my sleeping. Um, and my parents, they, they supported that. Like they were, they were really helpful with the nutrition. And, um, but it was all on my own accord. Like, I went to the gym on my own. I went and saw the goalie coach. I would go to skates. I would seek these things out. It wasn't like mom and dad were telling me to do these things. But when these things came up and I was supposed to maybe be working for my dad, hey, dad, do you need me to go move these brick pallets or can I go skate with these really good players? Jared, go skate with those good players. I can take care of the brick pallets, that type of thing. Um, and just in, in, in junior hockey, like I didn't know what to expect in the NA, the EJ or the USHL. You hear stuff. There's not social media back then. Um, but I just knew skating with other people and being able to self-evaluate that I felt like I was just as good, if not other players. And I knew if, if I got the opportunity from previous year's success that I, I could do some things. Um, and again, everybody wants the easy path. Oh, I'm going to go from Bantam triple A to midget triple A to the NTDP or to prep school to the USHL. And then I'm just going to go to college. And there are some people that have a very smooth path. Mine was uh, like this with a lot of bumps along the road, but I think it helped shape me. And, um, I, I, I think I had some level of talent, but I think that my strongest talent was probably my compete, my determination, my passion, my will to win and my will to prove people wrong. And I think that's where that got me. Um, and I think my parents would argue and say, Oh, Jared, you're so talented, this and that. And I did have some talent, but, um, I, I think dealing with being cut and being told no, that, that was the fuel that fired me. That was the fuel that, um, made me want to be a good player. And again, not trying to pump my tires, but I think if you ask my college teammates, I, I was pound for pound, one of the strongest players, one of the best players in shape. It helped at the parties on the weekends where I wasn't afraid to go jerseys optional and take the tarp off. But I knew for me to play, I had to be in peak physical condition. I, if I wanted to play 35 plus games, that's what I needed. I wasn't physically gifted enough to just suck down Coke heavies and bomb bombs and donuts and put on the pads and the pads and be able to stop a puck. Like those were the kind of the sacrifices that I needed to make. But in hindsight, I would do all those sacrifices all over again because it was totally worth it. Yeah, like I, I was having a conversation with my brother last night, actually, just t talking hockey, talking to some guys and how, you know, these these programs are, are promising. Yeah, you'll have you come play for us. You'll have the option or the um, access to these training facilities. You'll have the access to this weight room or, and all that. And Sean brought up good points like that's great. He's like, I have access to a gym every single day. I still don't go, you know, it, it, you really have to be self-motivated. That's something that like you can't really teach and you can't really, um, you know, you can, you can bring the, what's the saying? You can bring the horse to the well, but you can't make them drink the water, drink the water. It's kind of sounds like that with you, where it was like, you had that innate ability to just be like, I know what I need to do to get to where I need to be. And I think that's a testament to, not only your upbringing, but kind of your, your makeup. And I, I think it, it, it says a lot about you. Yeah. No, I, I was kind of that horse that kept trying to go to the well and people were moving the well from me and wouldn't let me get a little, they wouldn't put any water in my bowl. That was kind of the horse that I was, but no, like, um, I think that obviously there's a lot of things that shape you through it. Um, I think I got lucky to a gentleman by the name of Dan Stewart. He, he moved to Connecticut while I was at Avon Old Farms. He's now the assistant goalie coach for the St. Louis Blues. Previous to that, he was in the OHL, but he, he opened a, a goalie facility in Cromwell, Connecticut. And I would start to do individual lessons with him every once in a while and um, built a really good relationship with him. He built a good relationship with my family. And he was kind of a person to lean on where I went through obviously some hard things at Avon where I wasn't playing a ton and I could have just packed it in and um, I would lean on him and my family would lean on him. Like, Hey, what do you think? And he was, he was very honest. He's like, Jared, you need to be better. Or I think you can play juniors. I think you can play D one. It's going to be a hard path from you. And, um, obviously I can't thank him enough for that stuff. But again, yeah, I mean, my, my, my parents, um, my dad's super successful, but he, he's had to work his nuts off for everything that he's gotten. I think people see him now and they're just like, Oh, like he's got an easy life. Like, no, like I saw that guy wake up every single morning at five 30, so, I mean, 4.35 a.m. and he was gone, never had breakfast with him. He'd always make an effort to be home for dinner. 
Um, but he, he'd work his nuts off. He was his own entrepreneur, started his own business. And I think seeing how, how hard he worked and the way that he worked and also my mom, how she raised us and was taking us all over God's green earth for our sports, whether I was playing soccer, basketball, hockey, golf. Um, she was super, super supportive and, um, very, uh, very positive and optimistic with a lot of things. And my, my dad, as hard as he worked, he always made a conscientious effort to try to make whatever games that he could make. Um, but as a kid growing up, when you, you see this guy getting up at four, four thirty AM, um, and then he's whatever KO'd at night because he's working so hard. Um, I mean, I, I don't think you can't help but have that bleed onto you a little bit. And I'm not saying I have his same work ethic. I, I hope it's close, but now whatever, as a player and now as a coach, I, I use that as an example. And my dad was a very good role model um, with how he handled himself and even just dumb stuff, whatever. Back in the day in high school, he forced me to take public speaking at Avon Old Farms. And then he forced me to take public speaking at RIT. I hated it. I didn't want to do it. But now as a coach, I do a halfway decent amount of public speaking. So I think he's, he's smarter than he looks with that stuff. Um, but again, like I said, my, my, both my parents were really good role models, even my sister, she was a pretty good high school athlete, um, played division three tennis as well, too. And she, seeing her determination, she's a very passionate person. So I think I was lucky with who I was kind of surrounded by. And um, we were it's OK to fail. It's just how you react and how do you respond to those failures? Yeah, I want to talk about your transition to the pro game. And like Ryan mentioned and you mentioned, like you, you, you essentially achieve everything you could want to get out of our RIT, right? You set the records. Um, the future must seem bright. And did, did the harsh reality of, of pro hockey hit you in the face? And second part of this is, can you just give us like uh, an idea of how much harder it might be for a goalie to, to make it when there's only two spots or really one? <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, obviously as a kid growing up, you dream to play pro hockey. Um, I was super pumped, was very lucky to, to sign a contract in the Capitals organization. Um, went there for, for rookie camp. And at the time, I didn't know it, um, but I learned really fast. So I show up to camp and the two goalies basically had played for the Capitals that year, Michael Neuvirth and Simon Var Varlamov, both starting goalies. And then in the American League was Danny Sabarin, who played a ton of NHL games and uh, played whatever, a lot of American League games. And then the other goalie there was Braden Holpe, who I had no idea about, but Holpe was at rookie camp with me and we hop on the ice and I see him skating and I'm like, holy crap, like this kid's like five years younger than me. He's bigger, stronger and faster than I am. And I'm 25 years coming out of college. Like it might be a little bit of an uphill battle here for me to make my way up the system. Um, and I, whatever, I, 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 I had, a, I did have a really good training camp there with the Capitals at rookie camp. Um, but that's here, whatever you, you learn fast. I, I sat down with the, the, the goalie coaches there and they were just like, Hey, um, you showed really well, but we're going to send you down. We want to give our younger guys a look. You're going to start the year in the East Coast League and kind of go from there. I was like, well, like that's kind of different than I was told before I signed here. Like I thought I'd be able to compete in the American League. And they're like, no, you're going to be in the coast. And if there's injuries or guys play poor, then we'll call you up. You could definitely play in the American League, but there's just going to be guys ahead of you. So that was definitely, um, something that I wasn't totally expecting. And then went to Hershey camp, had a great experience in Hershey and then got sent down to the East coast league. And um, I, I think I had uh, my mindset was fine. I think I should have been more excited, more appreciative, um, more eager with how things were in the coast, um, especially in South Carolina. Um, good group of guys there. I, but I was just, Hey, I want to get up to the American league. I want to get up to the American league. How do I do that? And it took me a little bit of time. But then when I got up there, um, I, I had some good games. I had some bad games. And I learned fast, you can't have any bad games, especially when you're a 25-year-old rookie. And if I could go back in time, um, I, I wish I would have played better. I, I didn't. And then I, I obviously got sent back down to the coast, and I deserved to get sent down. Um, but when you're, you're that age and there's 19 and 20 and 21-year-olds that – may not be as good as you, but they think that they can get there as a goalie with one net. Um, you, you better be totally locked in. And I, I see it now with some older goalies coming in from college that, that make the most of it. Like I, I think of Muse that won national championships from BC. He's had a very good career in pro. Pat Nagel is a good buddy of mine. 
very similar. He had to start in the coast, and now he's playing a lot in the, in the American League. Ryan Zapolsky, another good friend of mine, he's the same thing. Th- those three guys for me, they they took advantage of their opportunity, and I didn't take advantage of it. Um, my second year, I signed an East Coast League deal, um, but I was lucky enough I got to go to the Boston Bruins training camp. I played a rookie game there. Um, but another thing, too, when I was there, they had Tim Thomas and Tuka Rass. They had just won the Stanley Cup. Michael Hutchinson was my goalie partner. Him and I used to do goalie school together growing up. Um, and Mike's played, obviously, a good amount of pro games. So it's just like, man, like you learn fast, like how tough it is to play games in the American League, let alone the NHL. Um, so I got sent down to Providence, played a little bit in Providence. And I get, then I started to bounce around the coast. And that second year of pro, um, I was already on two East Coast League teams. I was about to go to a third team. And everyone just is like, oh, you're so old. You're so old. I'm like, literally, this is my second year of pro hockey. Like, how am I old? Like, um, and I just felt like just seeing the writing on the wall. I could have gone over to Europe. Um, but my girlfriend at the time, who's my wife now that I met at RIT, she had a full time job and I didn't really want to go over to Europe by myself. I had just never been there. Didn't really know much about it. Wasn't comfortable. And when I was about to go to my third East Coast League spot, um, I called my RAT coaches and said to them, like, hey, I think I might want to get into coaching. Do you think I would sink or swim at it? And they're like, we actually think that you'd be really good. Um, there's a D3 program starting up called Nazareth College. George Roll is the head coach. George Roll used to be at Clarkson. He actually recruited me a little bit when I was in junior. So I had a relationship with him and um before I was about to go to that third East Coast League spot, my second year of pro, I was like, you know what? Like, I'm going to get my foot in the door now. I know it's November, but let me try coaching. I'm 25 years old. I, or I was 26. Like 26, that better be young for coaching. Like people better not tell me I'm old again now as a coach. Like I would think I'm young. I'm in my mid twenties. Like give me a break. And, um, then I then think kind of went from there, but I, 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 I liked pro hockey. I didn't love it. I really missed in college. Um, I missed a relationship with my teammates, with my family, with the families, the coaches. Um, I felt like in college, I knew all of my teammates. Um, I knew the coaches. I knew that they were invested in me. And in pro, it's just different. The guys have families and kids and jobs that like when they get out of the rink, like you have no idea what, what guys are doing. And in college, like you knew what everybody was doing. Like you knew if for whatever the freshman was having his first date with a new girl and stuff like that. Like that was just one of the fun things about college. Um, and my relationship with my coaches, like all, all, all three of them there, my last two years at RIT, like we were very open and honest when I did things poorly, they would let me know it. And when I was playing well, they kind of left me alone and in pro, like the, uh, the coaches are just different with their relationships. You're, you're just another person and they need to get you to do things a certain way. You're not, George or Ryan, you're just player X and player Y and you better get the job done. And if you don't, they're going to find somebody that will. So it's just, it's just different. Not like it's bad or anything like that. Um, the pro hockey is just different. And even John Leonard that, that played for us here at UMass, he's back in town. I saw him the other night. I was like, Hey, year one in the NHL, like living life for the show. How was it? He's like, you know, it, it was, it was awesome. He's like, but it's just different. Like you get out of the rink at noon and the rest of your day is wide open and all the other guys got to go back to their wife and kids and their families. And us younger guys are looking left, looking right. Like, what do we do the rest of the day? Let's go golfing. Like, it's just, it's just different in pro. Um, we're college. Obviously there's a lot more structure and, and things of that nature. So some people really thrive in the pro game. Um, for me, kind of finding my routine, what was a challenge and I needed to find that routine faster. And I think that's why my, my career was so short in pro hockey. Yeah, so just kind of going off the coaching side of things, you know, you it, it seems as though you knew right away you you wanted to stay involved in the game. You wanted to, you knew that hockey was what you wanted to do. Um, you know, how, was that just kind of like the logical thing for you to do at that time, peeling out of pro hockey, having a successful resume, knowing that you had something to give back, you know, and last kind of part of that is is that a lot of times when we talk with coaches, they kind of think they have something, some unfinished business in the game in a way. Was that somewhat of your feeling that like, not only did I have a lot to give the game, given my resume, but there's some unfinished business there as well. Yeah. No, I mean, for me, just like a lot of us, I think in the summertime you work camps 
and you coach, whether you're in prep school or junior or college. Um, and I always really enjoyed the camps. I enjoyed spending time with the kids, coaching them, learning. Um, I mean, people get chirp RIT for being a, a nerdy, dorky school. I, I'm a nerdy, dorky hockey junkie. Like that's who I am. I'm, I'm not, I'm not ashamed to say that. Um, and when I was at RIT, I got really passionate. Like I, I whatever. I majored in business, but I'd also like to say I majored in hockey and learned a lot from our coaches. I, I loved the pre-scouts. I loved practice. Um, I looked forward to playing a new team and knowing weaknesses for that opponent or ways that we could find a way to beat this team. Um, and some goalies aren't like that, but I, I mean, I think if you talk to my, the D that I, I, I played with in RIT, I communicated a ton. I would try to call up the four checks to try to help them, to help myself. Um, obviously with the pre-scouts, uh, from a goalie's perspective, like you want to know what teams are trying to create offensively, what they're trying to do on the power play. And I really, really learned, I felt like I learned a lot from the coaching staff in RIT. And I felt like that enhanced me as a player. And I got passionate about it in college. And then in pro, obviously you learn a lot from those coaches too. Um, it's some coaches, they find, they go through things with a fine comb detail like Coach Carvel does here at UMass. And other ones are more, hey, grip it and rip it, baby. Let's see how we go tonight. So coaching styles are different in pro. Um, but I, I just felt like from working camps in the summer and what I learned at RIT, I, I, I thought I could have success in coaching. And I didn't know if that meant college, pro, prep, midget, bantam, whatever that may be. Um, but I, I love the game. I wasn't ready to step away from it just yet. And was very lucky at Nazareth, George Roll, my boss there. He, he let me kind of run wild as a coach, whether it was doing practice, recruiting, um, compliance, admissions, equipment, um, doing travel, all those things that you have to do as a college coach. Um, and I enjoyed it. As dumb as it was, too, like I enjoyed ordering the swag for the players in D3. I want us to look good on the road. If you want to, look, if you want to play good, you got to look good. So those things, and um, I enjoyed that. I, I was passionate about that, and I loved college game. And um, lucky to at Nazareth, I got my master's paid for. So it was kind of like, hey, if I don't like this coaching thing, uh, I can fall back and, and use my master's degree to get my foot in the door. Um, but one of the things too that I think really kind of maybe nudged me a little bit on the coaching side was my, uh, at RIT for a business major, you have to do two co-ops. Co-ops are basically an internship. So I did one my junior year with my dad, working for his company, was all over the place. That that was fun, but different. And then my senior year, I did one with Kodak, the film company, very popular name, um, worked 40 hours a week, was in a cubicle. And basically after like two weeks of, of being in a cubicle, I was like, I can't do this for the rest of my life. Like I, I, Kodak paid me very, very well from an internship. Like it was awesome. But basically after week two, I'm like, I need to be out and about and be around people. And um, when I got to NAS, like you, and then you're coaching, like you're out and about, you're around people, you're around the players, you're around people on campus. And it, it just kind of fit my personality. And um, obviously Getting to the Division Three, my goal was to move up the coaching ranks. Um, but it was it was great. I mean, still this way as a coach, like it's great to see our players have success, whether it's being in the lineup or being an All American. That that for me is just as rewarding. It doesn't matter that. And um, like we again, not to get too deep, but we we as coaches, we have the ability to, to positively change kids' lives. And I felt like my coaches at RIT positively changed my life. And I want to have that same relationship with our players here at UMass, at St. Lawrence, at Nazareth. Um, I think if you talk to anyone that that's had me as a coach, I do a pretty good job of still staying in touch with the, the players that I've worked with. Cause I know I would not be in this seat if it wasn't for them. Um, so uh, yeah, I mean, I don't know if it's unfinished business or just feeling like you can still have a positive effect on, on individuals, on teams and, um, I'll say this too, and, and Carvey knows this from working together for a while. Like I just still crave competition. Like I need competition. I need to compete. I want to beat people. I want to win. I want to prove people wrong. Um, we had that mentality at St. Lawrence. 
we still have that mentality here at UMass. So I think it kind of fits my DNA um, where, again, I, I just still love that competition. It's hard for me. I try to avoid some things. My wife knows this. She's super competitive. But even like if we play cards against humanity or ping pong, um, I just I have an issue. And it was this way back in the day with Little League. Like I just hate to lose. I hate not to be successful. So as a coach, this kind of still gives me that ability to get to that competition. Um, as an individual now, whatever, I, I can golf. That's probably as, as far as it can go with the competition and things of that nature. Um, but that's kind of how it all kind of happened from the coaching side of things. And that, that impact you talk about, um, did that, did that help any, um, you know, feelings of missing the game, missing the heat, missing the competition that you talked about? That's what I get out of coaching it. Like I love working with kids. Like you said, I like helping these kids kind of reach their dreams. And that's where I kind of pour all my energy into it. Yeah, no, for sure. I mean, I think when you first get into coaching and you could probably test this, George, like you still want to throw the gear on, like you want to show the boys how it's done. Um, I mean, I haven't done that in years, but when I was at Nazareth, like I'd still put the gear on and play goalie in the summertime and, and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, no, I, I saw it this year with, with Nolan Gukowski who played for us at St. Lawrence and then joined our staff here at UMass. Like you could tell, like he wanted to go out there and play in the worst way. And if the guys weren't playing well, he'd be like, just give me the gear. Let me go out there. It's like a uh, fridge. Like our, our playing days are young here. We're coaches now. Um, yeah. So, but no, it, it's, it, tough. It, it's it, tough. It, it's, it's tough, but it is again, it, it's, it's still, it's the same. It's a similar level of pleasure when you win. Yep. It's that same, Hey, we, we beat those guys. We found a way to get it done. We won. Um, and it's, the, it's not to the same level, but it's close when you lose, um, like when I lost as a player, I couldn't sleep at night. When I'm a coach, I, I, I still can't sleep at night. Um, but it's not, uh, again, you're, you're more trying to invest in each individual players and, and the team's success. And, um, no, again, I'm, I, I love what I do for a living. I'm, I'm, I'm very lucky. There's some people that I think would absolutely despise this job, but for me personally, it, it's, it's a good fit. Yeah, and you really had to similar to like your playing career, your coaching career. You had to climb the ladder. You really had to you had to earn it, right? So I guess what was that? What was it like getting that call from Tarvey to join uh, the St. Lawrence coaching staff, or how did that go down? Yeah, so um, my last year at Nazareth, I was finished. I finished my masters, and kind of George and I had the discussion. Hey, once you finish the masters, like I want to move on to Division One, and George was more than supportive. Um, I feel bad for the guy. He made a zillion calls trying to get my foot in the door. Um, and that last year, like I got a bunch of no's or not even callbacks. Um, a lot of the coaches that we compete against now were coaches that I was calling, begging, Hey, like, what do I got to do to get an interview? What do I got to do to get my foot in the door? And I had a relationship with Chris Mayotte and heard that he might be in the mix somewhere else. And out of the blue, I think right around the 4th of July, uh, I get a call uh, from uh, a 315 number. It's, uh, or uh, I think Carvey's number is 315, but it was whatever. Greg, Greg Carvel's calling in, beeping in. Hey, um, it's Greg Carvel from St. Lawrence. I just lost an assistant. Um, do you want to, what's your interest in St. Lawrence? And I was like, I'll drive up there right now. Like, do you want to talk right now in person? What do you want to do? And he's like, man, put just your, put just, your PJs on. Yeah. <laughs> no, he's like, hey, hey, just relax. Um, but we went through whatever I, I thought it was a pretty vigorous interview process and there was a multitude of really good candidates and had a, a few phone calls with Carve, a few phone calls with Mike Hurlbut. Um, I went up to campus and met with them in person and then I went up and had a formal interview and was was lucky enough to get the job in, in a pretty cool moment for my family and I. Um, Carve called me the day before my wedding to let me know that I got the job. So literally like just re finished our rehearsal dinner. We're going out to dinner and Carve calls me. Hey, I just want to let you know you got the job. You can tell your parents, just don't put it on social media, that type of thing. I'm like, this is a, like the best wedding present ever. Um, but uh, like I got a honeymoon in a couple of days that I got to go on. And he's like, hey, go on the honeymoon, do whatever you got to do. Whenever you come back, you come back. So he was very, very understanding of that. But um, I, I think that whatever... My wedding was a pretty good time. I think when I found whatever, when we found out that I got the St. Lawrence job, I think I put the wedding on steroids and we got after it for sure. Yeah. And um, I mean, Canton's a special place. St. Lawrence is a special place. Um, 
I guess the next step is what was it? It must have been hard to leave like after you guys had achieved success there and got pretty close to your goals, you could say. And um, what was it? What was it like uh, leaving for UMass? Yeah, I'll say I'll say to the guys that. So you left after my senior year. So there were some guys or yeah, so we left the same. We were you were there the two years, my junior, senior year. And then the guys that were still there that I was friends with were devastated. They were devastated. And so I'm sure it was certainly, you know, your first your first go around at the D1 level. Canton, like George said, you fall in love with. So I'm interested to hear how how you felt. We know how Carvey, Carvey's rooted out there. So I just yeah. love to hear what you got. No, I mean, I, I think for my like, first opportunity, Division One, I, um, I think I was 27 years old when Carve hired me or 28. Um like my wife and I, we love St. Lawrence. I think that was a personally, that was an awesome spot to start our marriage. We got to spend a lot of time together. Um, obviously, whatever. I love my wife, Kara, to death. Um, but I think that was a cool place for us to start our marriage where we're somewhere a little bit remote. Um, but as you guys know, St. Lawrence is a very, very special place. It's a tight community. Um, the people there really welcomed us. They welcomed myself. They welcomed Kara. Um, and I think again that that blue chip uh, people doubt you mentality. I think that's ingrained in St. Lawrence, and Carvey was awesome to work for there. I mean, he's still awesome, obviously awesome to work for now. But going into our first year there, Gunner George, your brother there, he's the captain of the team. I think I think we were picked like eighth or ninth in the ECAC. Um, we ended up finishing second. had a had a really strong season. We were just on the outside in for making the NCAA tournament. Um, and then the next year, we were picked a little bit higher, um, lost in the ECAC semis again, just on the outside in for making the NCAA tournament. And um, Carvey gets the call for UMass, and he's basically like, hey, if I accept this job, you're coming whether you like it or not. And um, as a coach, personally, it, it, it made the most sense to next step um, – um, also it's closer to my family. My family's from Connecticut. They live about an hour and a half from UMass and in Canton, Karis, my wife, her family's from Buffalo. Buffalo, I, I think is maybe three, four hours away. My parents in Connecticut were like five hours away. We wanted to start a family. Um, so selfishly, UMass made the most sense for Kara and I, for our, to start, for us to start a family where we could get some help. We just weren't comfortable doing it in Canton being so far away from our families. Um, so that kind of meant we could, we could start the opportunity to not just be two of us to, to be three, four, or however many we wanted to be for our family. Um, but leaving, leaving St. Lawrence wasn't easy because of the, the tight, tight relationships that we built there with our players. Um, and I think George and Ryan, you guys can attest to this. Like I'm still in constant contact with the players from those two years. Um, I mean, he, even the kids that we had recruited, like it was tough to say bye to them. And a lot of them ended up going to places outside of St. Lawrence. And that's just how recruiting is now. Um, but like I, I, I snap guys, social media, text, um, still in very constant contact with a lot of those St. Lawrence guys. We went on a trip to Italy during those two years, which I think made it even tighter. I think for my wife, Kara, she got to go on that trip too. So she got to be around the guys. Um, and it, it, it's a, it's a, it's a, it was a real special group of people. I think the culture that had been built there and obviously Carve started that before I was there. I was a part of it the last two years. Um, but it, it's something special to be a part of. And I think the, the guys were really passionate about it. And I, I, I totally get their level of, of how devastated they were. Um, I think down the road now, I think they understand why Carve and, and I made that decision. Um, but again, I, I think to this day, Carve, like, I think that's, you could see, arguably that's the toughest decision he ever made in his life. And it's hard after that success and where things were heading, um, and the people that were there to leave that it, it was, it was a very difficult decision. But I think when now you see the success that we had here at UMass, I definitely think we, we made not saying it was the right or wrong decision, but we made a decision that I think had to be made. Yeah, and it's not like you guys walked into a powerhouse either. So when you show up to UMass, I think it was uh, like five wins your first year. And um, I guess just, you know, talk about the rebuild, what yeah. it took. 
No, that the, it was tough. Like the um, probably whatever one of the toughest years personally of my life. Just um, our team wasn't great. Our facilities weren't in a great spot. Um, getting a million no's from kids that just don't want to be a part of it. So many people, all oh, you masses, you're never going to get it going. You're never going to get it going. Um, I think whatever coach Barr, his experience of kind of turning around union and Providence helped where our really dark days and things like that. He'd be like, Hey, I've already been through this twice. Like we're going to make through it. Like we just got to get good players and change the culture. We're going to be fine. Like, Hey Benny, like we haven't won a game in like two months. Like how are you being positive right now? Um, but I, I think that really, that helped again from a coaching side that really helped the bond between Carve, Benny and I, where we got really, really close. Um, again, you learn way more from your failures than you do from your successes. Um, so that first year was definitely a lot of learning going on. Um, and then we, we felt like we were bringing in a pretty solid class. Obviously the guy over my shoulder here, Kale McCarr was a part of that class coming in. Um, and we just put a premium on getting really, really good people, really, really good students, and really, really good hockey players, as basic as that sounds. And we took a lot of players that people didn't think could play division hockey or play in Hockey East or be a top six forward or a top D or whatever. Um, but we we were confident that they would help our program and elevate things and change things and uh, all of those kids that came in that first class, like they had the personal identity of, of facing a challenge and they wanted to, to, to prove people wrong. And you see that now. And obviously guys like Kale and Mario, John Leonard, Mitchell Chafee, they've all moved on and signed NHL contracts. But um, Jake Gaudette, Phil Laganoff, Oliver Chow, George Mika, the, those guys really took a large leap of faith coming here when our team was not in a great spot. Um, even Matt Murray, that's coming back here for his fifth year. He was previously recruited by the prior staff and he's been through a lot with us. Um, but yeah, no, it's been, it's been a fun ride. I, I don't think it's going to get any easy, easier here after the success that we've had. Um, but again, too, like we, we lean back and I know Carve does this with his NHL experiences, his St. Lawrence experiences. And now obviously the, the success that we have here, we, we lean back on that all the time. Um, and I, whatever, we're very optimistic about the future here, but those, that, that first year was definitely tough um, where you, you had to come in and your tail is between your legs and you're not winning a lot. And the, the guys aren't really ecstatic, um, but you just knew that that brighter days were ahead and optimism was coming. And um, it, it was that the culture was going to slowly change. Carve saw it at St. Lawrence with everything that he did there. And we were very optimistic with what we could do at UMass. Yeah. So I guess to follow up that, my only question would be is how, how is it, do you think it'll change that you guys don't have any Massachusetts players on your team right now? Like it obviously hockey players in Massachusetts being one of them growing up, it's BU, it's BC, it's Northeastern. It might, it's probably even UNH or it was when I was growing up, it, it might not be anymore. But do you see that the success you've had now, there's no more secret. You're no longer the underdog. Do you start seeing UMass kind of becoming that destination for those Massachusetts players? I mean, it should be given given the facilities you have. Yeah. No, I mean, you, you would think after our success and Carr's resume and the facilities that we've had and our guys moving on to the NHL, um, you would think more Massachusetts people would want to come here. Um, Honestly, um, I, I hope that's the case. If I had to put down money, I still think kids would lean on the bean pot. Um, obviously, it's a very historic tournament. Um, but for my opinion, it's, it's two games of the year. And if that's what you want to put your hockey career on, that's your decision. I would put my decision on Greg Carvel, NHL coach, two-time two Stanley Cup finalist, national coach of the year, national champion, I would put my eggs in his basket, but yeah. what the heck do I know? Yeah. Uh, so no, I mean, we, we do have Massachusetts guys on the team. Like we, we have Lyndon Alger, Colby Vigera, Jerry Harding. Um, they're just not our, our guys right. get a ton of attention. Um, and we would love to get in on the elite players from Boston. 
But the way that we recruit, like we want kids that want to be at UMass. Like we're not going to call and and kiss your ass. Like that's just right. not how we do it. Like you, do you want to come here? You want to be a part of it? Again, Kale over my shoulder here. Like we never brown nosed Kale. Like Kale wanted to be at UMass. We didn't have to beg him to come here. When when we came in, he was already committed here. He could have gone anywhere in the country and schools were trying to get him to go anywhere in the country. Let me tell you that. Everyone's like, oh, you walked into a great situation. Like you guys inherited Kale McCarr. Do you know how many schools were trying to get that kid to go to their schools once we came in? Like we basically had to re-recruit him. But to Kale and his family's credit, they, they made a commitment and they were going to stick to that. And they committed to UMass for the right reasons. And they trusted us and what we were going to do. Um, so again, if the best players in Massachusetts want to come here, we would love to have them if that's where they want to come. But again, we're not going to, we're not the way that we recruit. We don't make promises. We don't make guarantees because you have to force those guarantees. You, you want to be the starting goalie. Then you better be really good. You you want to be a top six forward? Then you better be one of the best players on your junior team if you want to come in. That that's the, that's the fact of the matter. Um, and again, if kids want to come west of Worcester and see the beautiful Amherst, Massachusetts, we, we we would love to have them. We would if we could have a team full of Massachusetts kids like Minnesota basically does with Minnesota kids. We would love that to be the case, but we just know that there's a lot of legitimate fish in the waters in Boston. And most kids wake up wanting to play for BU, BC, Northeastern, Harvard. Um, but again, like I made fun of George earlier, hopefully there's some kids waking up in the morning with some Minutemen and Power UPJs on and they see the success of Kale McCarr and, and John Leonard and Zach Jones moving right on to the NHL. Um, but again, it's also on us at UMass. We're going to have to continue to do a really good job here um, to get those kids. And we understand that and we respect that. And I think with how we develop players and how we coach players and how we coach them as, as individuals and human beings, that's going to be on us to continue to do a really good job, um, for us to stay at a, at a very high level. And if we want to be able to compete against the, those Boston schools, cause those Boston schools do a very, very good job. We feel like we do things and we have things a little bit different out here and it's, it's special and, and things like that. But again, if um, if Boston kids want to come here, come on down. If you want to stay in Boston, stay in Boston. We're going to come hunting for you. It's going to yeah. change. I'll, I think it absolutely will just because, um, you know, I, I think I'm a guy. I, I think I tweeted it when you guys won that I was so uh, congratulating Carvey. And I'm the, I'm one of the biggest Carvey fans ever. And he told me to kick rocks after a year and a half. <laughs> So it's, it's not, it's not, I have every reason in the world to despise the guy, but I can't because I think that he's, he's building something special. He's built something special. And I think that anybody, you know, with two eyes should be able to, you know, see that. And I, I certainly see, you know, just as a Massachusetts guy, I'm interested. I see a changing of the guard in that, you know, I think, you know, you saw it Northeastern used to be the bottom of the barrel. Now they're getting some higher echelon Boston kids. And I just think that UMass is going to become part of that conversation if they aren't already. Yeah, no, I mean, I hope the kids are out there and hopefully the the good people like Sean Coffey remember uh, programs like old UMass when they got a blue chip stud coming up the ranks that they remember us. And, you know, I, I know we're Don't not sleep on mid Fairfield either. <laughs> hey, we'll, we'll, we'll take kids from that area too. come on down. The uh, good players, man. Hey, I, I, I try to say this to the families that are from Boston, like, hey, like, you, you know, most of our games are home and home. So, like, it's not like both games are going to be whatever, an hour and a half drive. Like, so you want your son just to go to whatever BUBC Northeastern, like the one of those games, you're going to have to drive your butt out here. So it's right. really not that, that big of a deal. But I, I agree, I, Ryan, like I um, Northeastern, the coaching the staff there has done an unbelievable job. Um, they work extremely hard and they've really, um, elevated that, that program here in the, the last few years. And they've been in the NCAA tournament and they, they do a very, very good job. Um, but again, we, we hope and, um, again, I'm not putting us in the same light as them, but, um, a main alum that's a good friend of mine kind of said, like, Hey, like watching your team play reminds me of like the main of the eighties and nineties. Um, where you have some really good players, but you also have some players that people didn't know about or didn't appreciate. And the style that you play is, is tough and it's aggressive and it's creative and it's playoff style hockey. 
And we, we need, we need to continue to win if we ever, whatever, are going to see ourselves as that. But I, I took that as a very flattering comment. Um, never would have thought of that. But again, I, I think what, uh, Walsh did there at Maine and their success and their players moving on to the NHL. I mean, it's a laundry list of players. If we're able to create the same thing here at UMass, I'd be very, very proud and, and blessed to be a part of that. Yeah, uh, we've, we've talked a lot about, um, learning from loss. And I want to ask about losing the experience of losing to UMD in the in the final. What you guys learned from that, and then um, I guess we talked about a little bit in the intro, but just beating. How, what did it mean for you guys to beat them in the semifinals? Yeah. Um, so so losing to them was super humbling, and I think it was something that had to be done. We were kind of the young buck whipper scrappers coming up, like hey, whatever. We had a really good year, like great season. We're going to just win the national championship. And it was kind of like big brother, little brother. Um, and I've told this story before, but that, that whole game on the bench, and sometimes you can, you can feel the momentum. You can feel a team's culture. I just felt like that whole game, they had their hand on our head and we were swinging, trying to hit them, trying to hit them. And they were just holding us like laughing, like beat it, get real. Um, and you could just feel like, their level of establishment of their team, of their program, of their culture. We, we just weren't there yet as badly as we wanted to be there. Um, and it was, it was super valuable. Really respect the Duluth program, their coaching staff. I think they do things the right way. Um, I think, again, similar to us, like they aren't the – I mean, they should be after all the national championships that they've won, but they're still not kids – first choice and things like that. They have to work and develop and coach and um, really respect what their coaching staff does. And so after that, and again, this is something that Carve does really well, but Carve's great at dissecting, self-evaluating, not just himself, but our players and our program, our coaching staff, everything around. And after that, we were like, hey, like, what did Duluth do? Like, what did you see? What did you feel? And video, what do you see? Um, and I think that kind of helped us fine tune some of the things that we had to do on a daily basis. Um, and every once in a while, like, I mean, it, it still crosses my mind, like D Duluth is an unreal program. Like what, what do we have to do to be like Duluth or what do you have to do to be like Duluth of the East? If we were ever Duluth of the East, I, I would, again, be, I would love for that to be the case because they have a crazy amount of success here over the last um, so many years. And if we were to have that same level of success, be very, very lucky. Um, and then playing them again in, in the semis, George, I mean, from the standpoint that we were down our leading goal scorer, our goalie that hadn't lost a game since, um, I think he, he finished on like a 14 game, uh, winning streak to be down those two guys. Um, and, and our, our, our third string goalie, Henry Graham, I think it was kind of an opportunity for our culture and for our seniors that came in after that five win season. Like, Hey, like we talk about these things, facing adversity, when the chips are down, when people doubt you, like this is a perfect example. And we're, we're facing the big bad bulldogs who we, we see as the standard for college hockey. Like where's our program at and how are we going to react? And um, we, we had a slow start to that game and Duluth has a really, really good team, and we just found a way to, to scratch and crawl and got some very lucky bounces, and sometimes that's how hockey goes. And then the, the overtime, the overtime was satisfying because it was like, hey, like we're, we're doing what we can do. We felt like for basically two and a half periods, Duluth was doing to us what we wanted to do to them, and then we had a, what we thought was a pretty strong overtime and to finally get that goal, it was just like, it kind of put things to rest from two years ago. Um, and I, Carver, you can talk to Carver about this. Uh, I don't know. I, I know whatever. I don't know what I want to, what I want to know what it feels like to lose in the Stanley Cup finals twice and not get that chance to taste that. But to lose in the national championship two years ago, like I'd be lying to you if I didn't think about that every single day. And, um, it's not like it's, uh, it's like a hate or anything like that. It's just like, how, how can I fix that? How can I do that? Right. Um, even for like a kid, like Bobby Trevino, um, really good kid, good person, great player. Um, but a lot of people forget, like he got suspended going into the national championship game against Duluth. So we didn't have him. So like 
for him, you're a kid, you work your whole life to get to college hockey and you, you get to the national championship game and you get suspended. Like, are you ever going to get back there? And very lucky that we found a way to get back there and we won the game. Um, and now we're very lucky that Bobby's coming back for another year and we're going to have a target on our back here. Like Duluth has to deal with, and it's going to be a new set of challenges, a new set of opticals, but we're, we're excited and we want to attack those challenges and we want to push through them. I love it. I guess we have one more before we send it over to our questions from the crowd. A couple of good ones coming. Um, oh, brother. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> the last one, I, what can, you know, what can anyone that listens to this learn um, from the culture that you guys have built at UMass that started maybe at St. Lawrence? Like, to tell us what, what that word means to you guys and yeah. how it's upheld every day. And yeah. where can, like, how can I or anyone that listens take that into their everyday life? Yeah. No, I mean, from the most basic sense, culture is king and culture can beat talent and skill any day of the week. And culture collectively can beat an individual group. Uh, uh, culture, then when individuals buy in together as a group, that collective group is better than the parts individually. And for, for us at St. Lawrence and, and here at UMass with our, our, our culture, it's, it's a way to live your life, not just with hockey, but with every single part of your life from school, from the dorms, from the community, to how you are with your parents, to how you are with your girlfriend, to how you are um, in the weight room, to how you are with skill development. Um, even for me personally, like I think about it when I'm on the road recruiting, am I, am I working to our identity? Am I living to our values? And um, the more that you're around it, the more powerful it is, the more that you believe. Um, but again, I, I don't think you can argue our success and, and carve success at St. Lawrence and, and here at UMass. And again, it's, it's very, very challenging. It's going to continue to be challenging. Um, but that willingness to be uncomfortable and to be super honest and to push yourself to levels that you didn't know of or to see your teammates or your players do things that you didn't think were capable. I think a lot of it has to do with the culture. Um, and it's still, I mean, even whatever, winning the national championship, like I still don't think it's really sunk in, at least for me personally, like you, you see the trophy when you walk in, it's like, really like we did that. Um, I think maybe a few years down the road might have a better understanding of it, but the culture piece, um, I think it's really, you really feel that when you leave it. Um, and you miss it and you want to be a part of it. And I think I, I feel that with the St. Lawrence players um, and even our UMass guys that have moved on. I still talk to them. And like, and again, this is where I think UMass and how we do things on the program is different. Like we win the national championship. K Kale McCarr is FaceTiming us in the locker room. Like Kale McCarr just won the rookie of the year in the NHL. Like he doesn't have to give two, two shits about, the hockey program at UMass, he's in the locker room just as excited about every single one of our players. And, and Mitchell Chafee, one of our players that signed to move on to pro hockey, um, like he's FaceTiming me like, hey, coach, congratulations. Like, Mitch, you just had a game tonight, man. Like you just scored your first pro goal. Like you really don't need to care about our program, but that's that's what our culture does. That's what it instills. And for the people that really understand it, like Kale McCarr and, and his father, Gary McCarr, like, again, I hope I'm down the road as smart as that family and able to see things down the road. But they really valued that and appreciated that. Um, and now we're lucky enough that we have uh, Taylor McCarr coming in, who we think is going to be a really, really good player. But the, the people that can look past the, the fluff and the glitz and the glamour and the, the shininess, like look at the substance and the people and who you're going to be around. And um, even seeing it, Coach Barr, when he left to go to Maine, I mean, he, he's dreamed of being a head coach, just like I dream of one day, hopefully I get lucky enough to be a head coach. But like seeing him leave, it was like tearful. You would think, hey, he's a head coach. Like he just wants to get the heck out of here. And like he, he, he like accepted the job. And he's like, I don't even know if like I want to leave. Like this is such a special place, such a special culture. Um, and I think that's why when we left St. Lawrence, we were building something to that. We, we didn't build it to the level that we have it at UMass, but I can see why the players felt that way. And um, 
culture is something that we're always going to work on and we're always going to appreciate. And we, we feel like that's the difference maker when we go in and face these teams that have a million first rounders and a million NTDP guys and the social media says they're going to sweep us and kill us. Well, all right, that's fine. We're just going to use that as momentum. We're going to use that as fuel and our, our culture is going to find a way to try to beat you. Yeah, I think the best part about it, too, like you mentioned, is that you get to carry it forever. And that's how I feel. I've talked about this before, that you don't truly understand it like when you're when you're there. I, I mean, some obviously they have it at UMass and later in St. Lawrence. But when I was there personally, maybe I was just, you know, a little immature. But, you don't. it didn't really hit till after I left. So I, I take it with me now, which is awesome. But this has been maybe a longer one than normal, but it's been awesome. <laughs> it has been freaking awesome. So. Should we, should we send it over well, to the... You know what? I should just say suck it to Sean for missing out on this longer than expected, but better than expected. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> He's All already right. texting us how to go, how to go, how to go. <laughs> <laughs> He's telling us get off too long. Um, <laughs> All right. I'm going to start it off. This is a very good one, and I'm, I'm actually a little upset. I haven't used this clip yet, but this is from Elliot. Uh, please ask... Uh, what, if anything, you drew from your own Frozen Four experience with RIT that helped you prepare for UMass and going to the Frozen Four? I have fond memories of the pre-tournament press conference and his response to a question about the Tigers' underdog status. Quote, underdog, overdog, this is you. You can call us Snoop Dogg. It doesn't matter. Or something like that. I don't think our team really thinks about that kind of stuff. We're focused on ourselves. We know uh, what everyone in the locker room can do. Um, I mean, we, we don't think about underdog, overdog. I mean, you can call us Snoop Dogg. We really could care less. Like, we're, we're, we're here to play hockey just like the other uh, teams that are here, and we're excited, and we want to prove to everyone what we can do. You know, ironically, Snoop Dogg will be at RIT on Saturday night playing at the Gordon Fieldhouse. Jared DeMichael and the rest of the Tigers hope they'll still be here living out this dream season and playing for the school's very first national championship. RIT Sports Zone's coverage continues all week long from here at the Frozen Four, but for now, in Detroit with the Tigers, I'm Kevin Roach. Um, so when, when we went through it at RIT, like no one gave us the time of day. Like we'd show up at the rink and the people there are like, yeah, just take that closet for a locker room. We went on the ice, they didn't even give us pucks. It was just like, you've got to be kidding me. Um, but we use that as fuel and, um, coach Wilson was really good, um, about letting us talk kind of freely in our press conferences and things like that. And, um, I, I'd, I'd be lying to you. Like I was bothered by how disrespectful we were, but I think that helped me personally. And I think it helped our team and, uh, coach Hills who works at RIT, he was really smart too, where he'd be like during the week, he'd be like, Hey, D Mike, like we're. Everyone's so saying this Denver goalie is better than you. Like he's the best goalie in the country. Like you can't even hold his jack. And I think he knew that kind of feel for me personally um, would maybe lock me in a little bit more. I know my dad, like my dad still does that to me every once in a while. Um, but just hearing some of the people and what social media was saying, and I, I try to be good about not listening to that noise. Cause I'm sure you guys see it as, as much good as there is in social media there's just as much bad. Like some of that stuff is just a cesspool, but like nobody was even giving us the time of day and thought it was going to be a blowout. And we had our first few press conferences and they're just like, all they were was about the other team. And I'm like, Hey, like we have a good team here. Like you guys have never even seen us play. Like you literally just look at the box scores, like show us a little bit of respect. And then we go out and we beat Denver and Denver had a, a really good team. And you know, if we play seven games, I, I don't know how many of them we win, but that game we found a way to win. And um, and then the next night we beat UNH 6-2. to two. Like they were the Hockey East champion. And see, people were like, hey, you guys are under. Blah, blah, blah. I'm like, we just beat UNH 6-2. to two. Like I was told Bobby Butler is one of the best players in college hockey. And he is an awesome player. But give us a little bit of respect. So I don't know why. And like in the heat of the moment, I was like, you know what? Like call us whatever the heck you want to call us. Like call us updog, overdog, underdog. Call me Snoop Dogg. Like, I really don't care. Like, we just want to find a way to win and have fun. Um, and I, our, our team, too, we had a few guys that maybe uh, were a little bit tense than other guys. Like, uh, not trying to call him out, but I'm going to call him out because he's a beauty. Is Scott Knowles. He was a guy on our team, really good player. 
Um, but going into the tournament, like he knew he was a little anxious. And I knew when I said that comment, it might get back to the boys. And like when he heard that, like he thought that was like the coolest thing ever. And maybe just trying to give the team um, some more confidence and things like that. Like when I did those press conferences, like some of it was calculated where I was trying to maybe pump up RIT. Um, I still feel this way too. Like I, Wayne Wilson at that time, he'd never won coach of the year, which I felt like was so disrespectful. We won three regular season championships in four years. Like, do you know how tough that is? And he didn't win coach of the year once. I was like, like, what the heck are these people voting for? Um, so those types of things too, like again, for our culture at RIT, like that's something that we use to fuel us. Um, but as a player to a coach, it's different. Um, but really whatever to kind of do to the two and helping for UMass, I think it was more maybe like the outside noise. Like you knew there was going to be a lot more media people at practice um, trying to get you out of your routine. Um, also too, like when you show up to the rink, just not being in awe of an NHL rink and the suite set up and your logos everywhere and you're at the frozen four as cool as it is. And you want to enjoy it. It is a business trip. Like you're there to win a hockey game, hopefully win that hockey game and then win another hockey game. Um, but again, I think at RIT, the, the break between the regionals and the frozen four, we, we had a lot of outside noise coming in. And I think that it was really hard to deflect that. And I think at UMass, we try to do the best that we can. And, and you talk about looking at Duluth, seeing how Duluth handles things there when they're at the tournament, like literally like, they do their exact same routine. They do what they want to do and they're where to, they're there to win. And that's all they care about. And we, we try to do the similar thing here at UMass with still trying to enjoy it at the same time. All right. Yeah. So next, <laughs> next fan question comes from Gunnar Hughes. What <laughs> makes a good penalty killer? Excited for this one. Yeah. So for for my opinion on a good penalty killer, and I actually think Gunnar Hughes is a great example of an elite PKer where he's got will, heart, compete, IQ. Um, so for we've whatever, we had a really good kill at St. Lawrence. We've we've got a pretty good here at UMass. Um, I think Gunnar's gonna want me to say shot blocking and things like that, um, which is an important piece of the kill. But we, we put more of a premium on making good reads, being aggressive, taking away time and space, putting your, uh, your opponent in an uncomfortable position and dictating the play. Um, I think Gunner just wants me to say, Hey, get in the shooting lane and wear it in the shin guards and get big low. Um, and Gunner did that. He had freaking nuts to steal that guy. I'll give it to him. He would wear one freaking off of the face if he wanted to. Um, Gunner also wasn't afraid to get up the ice and buzz a little bit and be a pest. <laughs> which he's very, very good at. Um, but also, too, Gunner was actually an unbelievable leader, like probably one of the – arguably one of the best leaders that we ever coached. But um, the PK is an opportunity to suck momentum from your opponent and give your team some juice, especially if you can find a way to get a shorty goal. Because if you get a shorty goal, that's when the – hopefully a big-time Sully comes out and the boys are feeling it on the bench. Yeah, he, he just wanted you to pump his tires. That's all that was. <laughs> <laughs> you guys all. use it. If you know, you go. I've, I've used that now a bunch. Is that, yeah. is that when there's like a 50-50 battle in the PK? Yeah. You know, you go. I love yeah, that. no, don't, don't hesitate. But the uh, funny story, too, for Gunner was in whatever we talk about being a pigeon or something like that. Way back in the day, and I still talk to him about this. I'm, watch, I'm following the St. Lawrence Instagram, and it's like their senior week. And, again, you guys know this from St. Lawrence senior week. Like, it's just a huge party, and there's the one – the one – Instagram is about like getting everybody in one spot and underneath it, Gunner writes like, don't be a pigeon show up or something like that. And I like liked it. And for the, like for eternity, him and I always still talk about it. Like I call him a pigeon. He calls me a pigeon, but uh, I always see that too. Like if he says he wants to hang out or grab a beer because we bumped into each other, I'll be like, Hey, make sure you show up. Don't be a pigeon. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. This is uh, all right. Moving down the list here. It's funny, Robbie Tessar. I grew up playing with Robbie Tessar in, in Lake Forest, Illinois, Lake Bluff, Illinois. But he wants to know this is an inside joke, I guess. Where'd you get that kick? Dot, 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 Walmart question mark. Does that hit home? Where'd you get that kick? Dot, <laughs> dot, dot, in, dot, inside joke from Avon. We might have to delete it. <laughs> yeah, we're I, don't, I, don't, I don't even remember that. I don't know. I don't know if I've got quarantine. Right? All right, we'll edit that out. All right, last one. 
no, uh, oh, no, 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 no. I know what I'm saying. Uh, yes. So <laughs> Robbie and I played uh, uh, soccer together. Not to uh, toot my own horn, beep, beep, but I was varsity soccer captain my senior year. And um, whenever we had a bad kick, our coach would like chirp us and be like, they like whatever. Where'd you get that kick or where'd you get that shot? Walmart. And like that was like his inside joke. So that that's what Robbie's talking about. But okay. um, the, our baseball coach did something similar too. Where like if you don't didn't feel the ground ball, he'd be like, if it was a cheeseburger, you would have had it. He would say that all the time. So those are two like inside jokes for me, man. Oh man! All right, I'm glad that one actually worked out. I was worried for a second. <laughs> um, last one here from Jeff. How do you work with the admission admissions office at UMass? I set a standard. Um, if you if you if the new standard is you send the questions and we ask them. Go yeah. ahead. No. So first off, Jeff Ricky was a pleasure to work with at at St. Lawrence. He was awesome to work with, and um, we have a very good relationship here with our admissions as well. To sending in applications, whether it's their transcripts, SAT, ACT scores, compliance, things like that. Um, we have some very good resources here that we're lucky to have at, at UMass. But Jeff Jeff was a pleasure to work with at St. Lawrence. Uh, my wife worked with him in the admissions department, department at uh, St. Lawrence, but I'd be on the road watching a player, might get his transcript and information, and I'd email it to Jeff. And within the day, Jeff would usually get back to me about where the, that student sat academically. So um, people on the outside don't truly understand um, how many resources you need, not just a nice rink and a nice facility, but support from your administration, um, your athletic director, admissions, compliance, housing, um, dining, all these things come into play when you're trying to build a strong program. So Jeff, Jeff helped us win hockey games at St. Lawrence, and I feel like our admissions at, at UMass helps us win hockey games as well, too. Love it. Well, I think that's about a wrap, guys. This has been awesome. So thanks yeah, a lot for coming on, great. D Mike. A lot of fun. I, I apologize for too, talking too much. I hope I tried to give you guys some content here, hopefully, get you some followers on social media here. I, I don't want Next Shift to be a pigeon like I am. <laughs> <laughs> no, we, uh, we're very thankful. Any- I'm a guest shares it. I, I've seen you sharing it all over. So we're very appreciative. I know George and Sean certainly are. Definitely. No, we appreciate it. And I th- actually think this is going to be, this is a great one. So a lot yeah. of fun, a lot of fun. So. Awesome. Thanks for having me guys. Yeah. All course. right. Chat soon. Forget about skills. Forget about X's and O's. It's a mindset of being believing. It's amazing what can happen. So you stand in there. You stand in there and you don't take a backward step. Not for a second. It's a great opportunity to stand right face to face with him and go right to him. There is no one taking a back step here. Right up here.